and we are going. Blinky lights on. All right, here we go. Our back health seminar. Thank you all for joining us. Um, tonight, we have Dr. John Herding, and he's going to talk about back health and how to maintain a healthy back, but also if you have some issues around back pain, ways you can kind of learn a little bit more about where that might be coming from, roots of it, and just ways to have, um, you know, longevity with our backs, because it's a thing that, you know, often gets kind of dinged up, and especially um, as we age, for those people like me who are finding that they actually need to warm up now, and when they don't, um, bad things happen to them. So, um, uh, yeah, so we'll get into it, and we'll share this. So, John, if you want to, um, you know, run through your, um, you know, brief background on yourself, take it away. Yeah, um, thanks, Wiley. Um, so, yeah, I'm Dr. John Herding. I own a practice down in Garnet Valley, and I've come up to the gym a couple times. Um, our, the practice is now called Precision Performance Physical Therapy. We just went through a transition in February. Um, and basically, we focus on um, active individuals and athletes. That's our entire practice. That's almost 100% of what we see, and it's um, athletes and active individuals from adolescents all the way up through professional and Olympic level. So we, we really specialize in dealing with high performing individuals, whether it's you guys yourselves who are working out, um, cause we would consider you guys high performing individuals and athletes. Um, everybody just has their own level of participation. Um, but you guys are a primary population and we have fun with some of the higher level athletes that we see, but that's really our specialty of, of, making sure that people are training appropriately and managing the training process to keep them active um, as they're working through an injury process. Um, we, we very rarely tell anyone to stop and rest. So hopefully some of the strategies we give you guys today um, help you, um, Wiley, you, you mentioned briefly that as you're getting older, you're finding you have to warm up a little bit more. Um, some of the things I'm gonna give you guys today are ways that you can get right into squatting, deadlifting, taking care of your back without having to spend 40 minutes warming up with band mobilizations and foam rolling and stretching. But how can we structure an exercise or position you appropriately to make sure that you can still get the gains that you want from squatting and deadlifting, but now your position is tweaked a little bit so that you're both rehabbing, bulletproofing, um, both rehabbing and bulletproofing your back at the same time. So some of the strategies we'll give you today are ways that um, you will rehab your back if you currently have pain, but there are also ways that we can now alter workouts a little bit um, for you, Wiley, and your coaches to um, bias them towards people in certain positions. Because um, we, we, we start to see um, when we're working with populations similar to the population at Subversus is most people are probably not um, biased toward back squatting. And um, just to open up with this, my philosophy recently has been, unless you're a power lifter who needs to back squat, you probably shouldn't be back squatting because back squat is probably more of a sport specific activity um, because so much is involved in a back squat with shoulder mobility and thoracic spine mobility that um, we should bias people more towards maybe front squatting and zercher squatting um, and goblet squatting instead of back squatting, which may put them at a greater risk for injury. Um, and really, where do we need to back squat except for an, if you're competing in powerlifting, right? Um, so that's, that's one of my philosophical biases right now. Um, but what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna share my screen and pull up a presentation for you guys. Um, actually here, let's do it this way here. Um, does anybody have any questions just based off of that? I think later, can we go over some tips for improving thoracic mobility? Because I have none. Yes, so what you'll find, can you guys see this presentation? Yeah. Okay, cool. What you'll guys find is, is my philosophy um, works from the inside out. So you have to, if you think about the foundation of a house, if the foundation is built poorly or on um, something that's not solid, the, the house is gonna collapse. The house isn't gonna be set appropriately, right? So I work from the inside out to set a good foundation of rib cage position, pelvis position, so that your low back is saved because it gets caught in the middle of those two. And then your shoulders and your hips are set up appropriately to be in good positions 
so you can squat, deadlift, and move appropriately. Um, we're not going to specifically address thoracic mobility outside of setting up a position that should just inherently improve that. Does that make sense? So instead of drilling T-spine extension and, T and open books every single day for a year and it doesn't seem to get better, I'm going to hopefully show you strategies where if we just improve certain things, you won't have to drill those every single day for a year to feel like you have to prepare yourself for a workout. Does that make sense? Um, because, because the way that I think is if you, um, Wiley, I'll just use you for example. You have to say every time you have to go work out, you feel like you have to warm up for 30 minutes. You have to hit your foam roll. You have to do your ankle band mobilizations. You have to hit your um, spider lunges. You have to hit your pigeon pose. You have to hit your open books and you have to hit um, like a banded shoulder mobilization. And that's your typical warm up to prepare your body for a workout. And it takes you 20 to 30 minutes. Um, but then you have to do that every day before you work out to make sure you're ready. Does that sound like a lot, like some of you guys or like other people in the gym? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, totally. Yeah. yeah. So, so my, my argument with some of that would be the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and achieving the same result. So we need to be more focused in the warmups or setting people up for positions that will um, lead to success and that lead to lasting success so that they don't feel like you need to go to the, uh, warm up for 40 minutes every time you go to the gym with the same exercises. Makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, so yes, we will, we, we, we will get um, some of that thoracic spine mobility. And if I don't specifically address what you're looking for, we'll just talk after and I'll make sure you get what you need. Okay. Um, Cause I know some of you just worked out, but there's some part of this where we could make interactive if you guys want to try some of this stuff just so you can find and feel the position um, moving forward in your workouts. Um, so quick, if you guys care about this, facts about low back pain, 80% will experience it. Um, huge cost to the healthcare system, $50 billion a year. Um, basically, most of us will experience back pain at some point in our lives, whether it's debilitating and you need surgery or just that small tweak that you'll have when you are back squatting in the gym and it was a high volume workout or just a little bit of soreness when you're deadlifting, right? Um, this is why there's a ton going on in the back muscle wise, but you'll see again, kind of the way that I think about things is this, all of this matters, but it doesn't really matter. All right. So um, very often we might not need to worry about this small, serratus posterior muscle that controls this thing and whatever. Um, if we look at things positioning globally, sometimes it just all kind of falls into place. Um, how do you know if you're at increased risk? You have a previous history. That's for every injury. If you have a previous history of injury, you're probably set up to have another injury. Um, decreased T-spine mobility, hip mobility, ankle mobility, lack of core control, lack of pelvic stability. You guys, this is the basic. You guys have heard most of this before, right? Um, lifestyle risk factors, age, poor physical fitness, overweight job smoking. Unfortunately, just as we age, muscles don't work. They don't work as well. Um, they have the accumulated stress of years of doing what we've been doing. Um, smoking affects cardiovascular health and how blood and certain healing things are um, you know, being delivered to the muscles, um, job, repetitive stress. Obviously, some of us have more repetitive stress in different ways than others. Um, I would consider sitting in a prolonged position rep repetitive stress. It doesn't have to mean that you're just, um, you know, standing up and sitting down or lifting objects from the floor repetitively. But if you're sitting in one position for 8 to 10, 12 hours a day, that could be a repetitive stress. Um, and that's where some people will run into problems too. If you think um, you're sleeping all night, you wake up, you sit at the table and you eat breakfast for, read the paper for 20 minutes, then you sit in the car for a 45 minute commute, then you sit at your desk for eight to 10 hours, then you sit in the car um, on your way to your workout, with, and then you try to work out for an hour, then you're back in the car sitting, then you're sitting at the dinner table, then you're sitting at you know watching TV. Um, that's a lot of sitting and maybe an hour of mobility and movement. And um, the 
The answer to that is not standing all the time with a standing desk, but how much can you vary your position throughout the day? Just the positions of comfort. Like, can you work sitting? Can you work half kneeling in like a lunge position with the one knee on the floor? Can you um, work standing a little bit? How can you vary your positions as much as possible so that you don't have these repetitive, what I might consider a repetitive stress injury by like sitting in a position um, for an extended period of time. Um, some of the stuff I'll go through today, just a the disclaimer, it's probably serious or if you're having bowel or bladder issues, tingling, numbness, burning, um, is it chronic versus acute? Sometimes acute things in a, with a tingling and numbness is a little more serious. Um, so just some of these things, guys, like consult a medical can, professional if you're experiencing any of this. So now how do we build a strong back and how do we specifically do it? Um, like from home in the certain in, in the current situation. Um, so basically, I think position dictates everything. Um, so you'll see here this guy gives shows a bunch of different positions, which you can understand how putting load on some of these positions might put him at an increased risk of injury. If you have have this guy with a lumbar lordosis and he's over exaggerated it, but if you have him now try to throw a barbell on his back to back squat, most of us have seen as he tries to get his arms back on the bar, he'll probably extend his low back a little bit more. And then when you put that load through the low back, that's why a lot of people end up with low back pain. Um, same thing here with the neck. As you start to load that, especially with the back squat, you're gonna get some compression um, on the back of his neck. He's going to strain, especially if he's cued to look up. He's going to strain a lot of these muscles. When you're cued to look up, your um, cervical spine will and your lumbar spine will mirror each other. Um, so that's why I don't. We won't use a cue to look up in a squat. We'll use a cue to kind of keep your neck neutral, but look your eyes up, because looking your eyes up will drive your central nervous system to perform and um, gain a higher sympathetic tone. Um, but you don't. We won't cue look your um, um, arch your neck, look up, um, because that'll stress here and cause an increased arch in your low back too. So usually it's neck neutral, eyes looking at a spot like six to seven feet in front of you, and then look your eyes up. Um, again, it changes a little bit as you get sports specific with a power lifter, but for general population, when you're looking at risk reward and you're just looking at general fitness or um, whatever it's, we keep neck neutral, eyes up. Um, so this is where we start to get into the fun stuff. If you look at, um, basically, if you guys um, think about it, what do you think's gonna provide more core stability? Is it gonna be the ability to control pressure from the inside out or relying on muscles to tense up and tone to keep you keep good stability and good position. What do you think is going to break down faster, a muscle that's straining or pressure that you're able to control from the inside out? Muscle that's straining. Right. So that's where we start to we start to get into a lot of these like strain type injuries is where a muscle is being overused to control a position under load. Um, that it isn't ready to do. And sometimes that load is just is reduced because there's been a lot of volume on that area um, over time. But sometimes it's just because um, whatever, posi whatever position, whatever joint was in, strained a muscle at an angle it wasn't able to control. So it strains because it was overworked. So this graphic here kind of shows what we call a zone of apposition, where we have your pelvic floor. Can you guys see my cursor? Yeah. Yeah. So you have your pelvic floor tucked under you and you have your diaphragm that kind of domes up under your ribs. So when these two oppose each other, that's when you can create the best pressure for core stability from the inside out. Because when you breathe in, your diaphragm drops and flattens, your pelvic floor drops, and it's like a piston that moves up and down with good stability. Right. You can see that here with the red. When you breathe in, Diaphragm drops, pelvic floor drops, and it's like a piston that moves up and down. 
right? When you start to get into like this increased low back arch, your, your ribs start to rise up and flare and your diaphragm flattens. And then when you breathe in, similar to this graphic here, the diaphragm brings your ribs up higher, increases your low back arch, and the pressure goes out into your belly. So um, this, uh, this happens, you know, you, it, this isn't something that you're perceiving actively, right? It's happening 25, 20, 20 to 25,000 times a day with each breath, but it's not these huge excursions of movement where every time you breathe in, you feel your low back arch. But at the same time, when, you, when we're starting to think about position and how this over time may lead to low back strains, if you're 20 to 25,000 times a day getting a diaphragm that kind of pulls you in, like stresses you into a low back arch, and then you get into, you get under a back squat where you arch your back and you put your hips back first and you arch your neck, you can see how that can lead to a low back strain. Same thing with the deadlift. When you look, when you're already kind of in this, what would be considered maybe a suboptimal zone of apposition and your every breath you take kind of drives you into a lumbar extension but then you set up on a deadlift you arch your back you look up and you, you arch your neck that's why we end up with with a lot of these low back strains because just position is going to dictate the stress put on that muscle and if you're stressing it 25,000 times a day then you're stressing it under um heavy load then you, you can you can see why it's going to break down at some point any questions about that So this is um, the soda can pop model of core stability. So when you guys, um, if, you, if you imagine a soda can, have you guys seen this before? Anybody familiar with this? Awesome. So if you try to squeeze a closed soda can, can you crush it? Closed? No. Closed. No, not a chance. But as soon as you open it, my five-year-old could crush it, no problem, right? So this is how you start to think about managing pressure for stability from the inside out with um, working proximal to distal, inside to out, right? When you can close your vocal force, so this is where um, like a valsalva maneuver, when you guys, you, you brace and you feel the pressure in your torso before you go heavy on a, on a lift. Are you guys familiar with that, that feeling? Now, if you think about that feeling, do you guys feel like you've kind of closed your throat and you've maybe tensed up like your pelvic floor and then you feel the pressure from the inside out pushing against your stomach? Yeah. Right. So that's building the pressure for stability so you don't have to rely so much on your abs to stabilize you under a 300-pound squat. Does that make <laughs> sense? Like this soda can, if you're able to create this soda can through your torso is not gonna break down as opposed to if you just tried to suck your belly button into your spine and do a squat under that. Have you guys tried to just suck your belly button into your spine for like good core, like to activate your core? Sure. Right. So if you guys try that now, try sucking your belly button into your spine. And if there's someone next to you, have them push you while you're doing that. Try that. Now, bear down, push into your belly, and close your throat with your hips tucked under you. Which one feels more stable? The second. Nobody wants to say the first? <laughs> um. Yeah, so there's issues with people with high blood pressure with doing that maneuver, the Valsalva maneuver, but if you're a healthy individual um, that's looking to perform at a, a, you know, under load, again, building that pressure is going to be more stable than trying to suck your belly button in, especially if you have load on your back or you're trying to pull load from the floor. Make sense to you guys? Sort of. So do you want me to explain it further? What are your no. questions? Got it. Hmm? Got it. Okay, cool. So this is where we start to think about position. And this would be my number one tell if someone has low back pain. And this is one of the measurements I take in the clinic. Because you can, so this rib flare here, this is a wider flare that tells me they're not able to get their ribs down, back, and in 
to stabilize on top of their hips to get this position in their diaphragm. So when you see ribs that are out and flared like this, yeah. their diaphragm is flat in this position. Their chest is up, their ribs are out, or that angle is wide and the diaphragm is flat. So they're not getting this dome of a diaphragm. They're not getting the pelvic floor under to create the soda can pressure here. Does that make sense to you guys? Mm -hmm. So my number one priority in this person is getting them to get their ribs down, back and in and get their hips underneath them and then build movement patterns off of that control right there. Okay. Um, so just what I, what I would call that an overextended posture. And this is what you see as this guy moved his arms up overhead and his back arched more, that would be an overextended posture. This would be maybe considered a little overextended posture because the ribs are up, ribs are flared in that wide angle and the diaphragm's flat. So problems with an overextended posture, they, you can't fully exhale for a, a good five or six second out through pursed lips. Again, the diaphragm carries you out into lumbar extension more than just down to juxtapose with your um, pelvic floor for good pressure control. It then starts to influence shoulder mechanics because if your rib cage is oriented up, up and out, then your shoulder mechanics, you're not gonna be able to go full overhead press. So this is another presentation, but you're not gonna, you're not a person that would be able to um, do a strict press overhead. You should do a landmine press or, or a wall ball or something. Um, again, your pelvic floor is compromised because you're not getting the pressure to, to oppose it. So if you're a female on the call that has problems with incontinence or leakage while you're jumping rope, um, this would be where we start. We want to start to get this to juxtapose to create pressure um, to provide pelvic floor concentric or like contraction activity. Um, low back pain because of the position that your low back is in. Um, and if you guys, so if you guys go into like a military posture where your chest is up, your ribs are out and your back's arched and you try to squeeze your butt cheeks. Pay attention to how they feel. Now try to tuck your hips underneath you, feel like your low back's rounded a little bit, get your ribs on top of your hips and then squeeze your butt. Which one works better? Hips tucked under or, hip, or low back arched? Hips tucked under. Tucked under, right. So there you start to see how position is going to dictate how muscles function. Um, another philosophical thing I'm going through right now is I don't think anybody has a weak core. I think it's all position based because if you guys just saw how that worked, I think, um, especially anybody that's in your gym, Wiley, most of them are training for a while, have been training for a while. So if your ribs are up and wide, all of the obliques that attach here, the six pack rectus abdominis that attaches here, they're all extended and in suboptimal positions to contract and control, right? So just like you guys saw with your glutes, I don't think anybody necessarily has weak glutes. I think the position that they're in puts them at a suboptimal position to contract. It's interesting that you bring this up, not to go off on a sidebar for, mm -hmm. for a moment, but one of the things that I've been uh, working through as like some homework for myself is a um, like a performance breathing, you know, certification. And yep. one of the things for two reasons, one, I think it's something that could be valuable to people from home to start to work on outside of like just another workout to do, but like having incorporating a breathing practice. Yep. It's one of the things that I've started to, even with some like the zoom classes I've coached, I've, I'm starting to incorporate it a little bit as a means to warm up, to start to really understand when we talk about creating pressure and breathing properly actually controlling your diaphragm rather than just having everything jump straight to your chest and losing the ability to create that inner abdominal pressure um mm -hmm. and i think it's something that in the future we're going to look at how we can start to incorporate that as part of a warm-up whereas before we might have just said okay well we want you to do you know x number of reps as warm-up well if we can incorporate some better breathing practices we're going to allow for a better position and then to your point, not have to not say, well, the warm up is 50 reps. Maybe the warm up can be fewer. We save the energy 
but through actually a more appropriate breath practice, we can get you into a better position to start with. So it's, it's something that like we're, I'm starting to play with when it comes to just, you know, coaching practice. Well, it's huge. I mean, you think like we, we don't necessarily hold, um, you know, like a plank, we don't hold a plank for time in the clinic. We hold it for breaths and you'll see people start to break down and that you, you if you're paying attention to their breath, they'll lose position. When, when you start to dictate um, a position-based exercise with breaths, it leads to greater, greater stability, if that makes sense. So we'll, we'll hold, we'll say, hold your, um, your plank for, for five breaths, but they have to be a good breath that's like three seconds in through your nose. Maybe we'll cue and exhale through pursed lips to engage a little bit more trunk um, core control. But um, yeah, we, we're holding most things for breaths, Wiley. And I think that's huge that you guys are adding that because if you're able to control your breath, you control your sympathetic, parasympathetic nervous system, and you're getting better fuel to all the muscles to make you more efficient in your workout. So you're not losing your workout because you're concentrating on a breath and over breathing and, um, and you're getting the things delivered to the muscles that you need to, especially in CrossFit to make sure you're performing at a higher level where if it's a chipper type workout, right? Cause I don't know if you've seen like a, an elite CrossFit athlete, they find their pace and it doesn't even ever look like they tire. They just keep at their pace and they just keep at that pace and keep going. It doesn't even ever seem like they lose composure in their breath. It doesn't ever seem like their form breaks down. Um, and they might collapse at the end of the workout, but a lot of times they're just like steady as it goes and they might go out of the blocks behind somebody less accomplished, but they're steady as it goes through the workout and they never, they, they never seem to lose composure. And I think a lot of it comes down to a breath and how they're, they're getting energy into the muscles. Um, and then tight hamstrings and calves, guys. So if you're someone that has chronically tight hamstrings and calves and you just can't seem to foam roll or stretch it out, um, think about how if you're this person, their center of gravity is now forward. So their hamstrings and calves, is, so if you have this, uh, this low back arch, your hamstrings attach on the bottom of your hips, like your sits bones, the bones that you guys are sitting on right now. If you have a low back arch with an anterior pelvic tilt, your hamstrings are always on stretch. Um, and your calves, because your center of gravity has now moved forward, your calves are always kind of turned on to keep you from falling forward. Does that make sense? Yeah. So you guys can test that if you stand up and play with the positions, but someone with chronically tight hamstrings and Wiley, your coaches, and you see this all the time, someone that says my hamstrings are always tight, but you test their hamstring flexibility and it's 90 degrees on their back. That, that would be a positional feeling of tightness because their hamstring muscles are always turned, like turned on tonically or on stretch. So they feel stretched um, or they feel tight because of position. So instead of going in and doing a hamstring stretch, like foam rolling your hamstrings and stretching your hamstrings, you know, three times 30 seconds, if we just had you do a rep or two of a, a certain type of activity, which we're going to show you, your hamstrings are going to um, feel better because they're in a better position and then you can move on. So your, your three times 30 seconds hamstring stretch plus your two minutes foam rolling it, which might take, I guess it takes like five minutes, can be reduced to a 30 second exercise just because you're doing a more appropriate thing that's more specific to your position and what and what your needs are. So I don't, sorry, I don't know if this is something you're like going to go into further or not, but I feel like I'm naturally like a fairly archy person, and I can relate to like the having trouble going overhead. And I always thought it was more of like a shoulder mobility thing, but maybe it's like how I'm set up with an archy back, and I don't know if which one it is, but I just thought mm -hmm. I'd throw it out there at least. Yeah, completely. So, so what I would say, the first thing I would do is look at your rib cage position because your rib cage is going to be the foundation for your shoulder blade, which is the foundation for your, um, your arm bone, your humerus, right? So, um, and, and sometimes there's anatomical things like women with large breasts, like they're in a more extended posture because they have weight that they have to now move their center of gravities around, right? 
Um, but I think, yeah, so, so for you, especially, it would be how we're altering a workout. Maybe you're not strict overhead pressing because you don't have 180 degrees of shoulder mobility going up fully overhead, but you're landmine pressing, you're wall balling, you're doing anything that kind of puts you at an angle here. Um, and we're looking at how can we set you up in the warm up with a better rib cage position through maybe some of the breathing techniques Wiley's going through, um, and how do you carry them over to, into the workout to maintain better positions, right? Because again, like with our populations and a majority of the people at the gym, you start to look at risk or reward, right? right? We everybody's there pretty much for fitness. Nobody's going to the games. So what's the most appropriate exercise to make sure that they, you stay healthy because nobody wants to be hurt, um, but you still get the fitness gains that you want, right? Right. And then, but, you know, if you're someone that, that wants to strict overhead press and that's a goal of yours, then you just have to understand, all right, this is the risk. This is what we advise you. This is how we can maybe set you up to do that more appropriately. Um, if you're going to do that, Maybe I recommend landmine press, but if your goal is to strict press 100 pounds overhead, you just have to understand the risk. Yeah. yeah. Um, so this falls into, we see a lot of people that look like this woman here. They're too far forward in their squat, and then they try to load it with a back squat. So you're going to crush this low back because now all she's doing is trying to extend from her low back to keep a weight here where all of us I'm sure have seen a million times, seen it or felt it, where if you throw a weight here to counterbalance her, whether it's front squat, zercher squat, or goblet squat, she'll be a little more upright and it's probably more appropriate for the way that she's able to maintain positions. Because you see here, she's a little extended, a little bit of an arch, hips are forward, ribs are up, so she's not keeping this pressure. Whereas this guy is keeping a little bit better of that pressure model and he's a little more upright. So I'd be more comfortable throwing a weight bar on his back than hers. Um, so like some of the stuff, just quick prevention. Yes, there's still value to foam rolling. Yes, there's still value to some of the traditional mobility stuff. Um, I would argue some of this position stuff will clean up the mobility. So if you do some of the positional stuff, you won't need to spend time on a band mobility exercise that you have to do every day, right? Same thing with the position stuff versus if I can find better position, like what we talked about before, my abs and my glutes are gonna be in a better position to contract and stabilize, right? And then you just start to get into some programming considerations or um, based on volume and, and load and um, and even, it's okay one day if you come in and you don't do the prescribed workout because you got five hours of sleep because you're up with your kid all night, right? Um, we have to start to look at some of those risk factors as well. If, if you're under recovered and you didn't sleep, like it's okay to scale back the workout a little bit so you can hit it hard later in the week when you're fully recovered. Um, and then improper mechanics, but this is something, don't place fitness on top of dysfunction. I don't, you know, everybody places fitness on top of dysfunction every day because what's really functional and dysfunctional, right? So I think it then just becomes, again, kind of weighing out risk reward, volume based things versus recovery. And then is your position, are you able to maintain a position that day that supports um, handling load, depending on the, the workout? So it really just becomes train smarter, not harder. And how do we manage, and that's why you guys pay Wiley and his coaches, how can you manage all these things that go into keeping you healthy and reaching fitness goals without ending up in my clinic because you got hurt, right? Um, and, you know, inevitably, if you're training four or five days a week, you ha may end up with these small tweaks and stuff. But how does the team you formed around you between Wiley and your PT and your Cairo or whoever – how are they able to manage the process so that you can continue to work out through like your injury process? Um, so preparing position, you guys, I've been talking about this and you guys have been waiting for it. Um, basically what I'm looking for initially is to, how do I get these ribs down, back and in? All right. And Emma, for you, this exercise, um, just looking at you might help to improve your shoulder mobility as well, which would be pretty cool. 
Um, so this is a little biased position based on, um, a, you know, a typical bridge that you might see. But this is an exercise we use a lot to help get people to control. And if you guys want to make this interactive and try it, I, I have no problem helping coach you guys through this right now. Um, but this is where you're, you're, the goal is you're getting some hamstrings to pull your hips underneath you. The reach at the angle, at the, like the 150 degree angle that I'm doing here, you're going to feel your abs get crushed, your internal obliques would bring your ribs down, back, and in. And you're going to feel almost like a lat stretch as you're going through this, right? And for a lot of people, um, so specifically addressing your question, Emma, mm -hmm. we need the top two ribs to have volume of air to be able to clear room for shoulders to go fully overhead. So we, for years, everybody preached diaphragmatic breathing, diaphragmatic breathing, but a good healthy breath gets volume at the lower ribs, in the middle ribs, and then the top ribs to clear room for your shoulders to go overhead. So in this exercise, we're cueing pull through your heels for hamstrings to tuck your hips under. We're cueing reaching further into a reach every single exhale, and you'll get some lat stretch and you'll feel your obliques get crushed. But then we're cueing almost breathing into your neck because we want volume in those top couple of ribs to clear room for your shoulders to go overhead, right? So we're not necessarily cueing or we're cueing still a breath that starts here, but then waves through middle ribs and ends up here. So we're getting volume in the upper ribs because that's what a good healthy breath should do. Um, when it becomes a problem is where we see people using these upper um, accessory breathing muscles, like your upper traps, your evaders, your, your sternocleidal muscle, like neck muscles and traps to breathe the majority of the breaths every day. But really a good breath starts here and waves up with rib expansion and volume going all the way up. So this is an exercise we use almost on a daily basis to help people find better positions to get these, your ribs and hips to oppose each other. And this clears shoulder mobility, this clears back pain in a lot of people. Um, and it's become a staple of programs that address those things. So is that something you're holding for the breaths again? Or are you doing like reps for that? No, we'll, we'll typically go um, maybe five reps for four breaths each. But a, but a breath, and you can kind of hear it, is in through your nose for three seconds, out through your mouth for four to five. Um, pursed lips will help bring the ribs down a little bit more, get a little more rib engagement. So in reality, it's a 20 second rep. But you're looking for exercises that help get things into position for hamstrings to get crushed, abs to get crushed, shoulders to be able to now go overhead strict. I think they've done this one with um, Nick, right? Yeah, Perugini. Yeah. Yeah, but definitely. It's more like uh, a hamstring thing, like a like a hamstring focus thing than it was like breathing into my neck, though. Yeah. So sometimes we'll cue it differently depending on what we see in people's position. So yes, we put this out on YouTube and we'll generically say, you know, do this. Mm -hmm. But then we start to get into the intricacies of, all right, this is where I saw that you moved pressure because there, there's inherent asymmetries in everyone, mm -hmm. right? So sometimes we'll shift people's hips in this. Sometimes we'll have them reach, um, you know, maybe a right side a little bit more or engage their left side a little bit. So um, that's where kind of the skill of the practitioner comes into play where Nick might have thought it was more appropriate to cue hamstrings versus um, – maybe more appropriate to cue like an upper upper neck and upper ribs. Yeah. Is there any advantage to the arms being all the way back on the floor? So I would, um, 
I have not seen anyone that can put their arms on the floor in that position without arching their low back. Oh, <laughs> Damn, I kind of want to try that now. Right. Yeah, you can totally try it and I'll coach you through it. Um, sometimes we will, again, depending on position, we'll have people reach their arms straight up. But for the purpose of this presentation, this is the one that I felt would hit most of the stuff globally without assessing each of you individually. Okay, hold on. Yeah. So I'm gonna put my feet on this little thing. Yep. Right. And and again, you can bias foot position based on the goals as well. But those are trade secrets. Am I doing it? Uh, hold on. I can't see everyone in the screen. <laughs> Am I reaching? Um, yes, but don't put your hands on the arms on the floor. Bring them up uh, back a little bit, so they're kind of like right there. So if you actually, if you put your heels on that ottoman, right there, yep. Tuck your, tuck your hips and kind of roll off so you feel your ribs come down, yep. right? And as you exhale through pursed lips, reach your arms further into that angle. And you should feel your hamstrings, your abs, and maybe a lat stretch. Yeah, that always, that always makes me cramp in my hamstrings. Literally right. always, like every single time, no matter how many times I do it. <laughs> right. And that, that's just the neurological positional cramp where your hamstrings are so used to being on stretch because you have that like anterior pelvic tilt that mm -hmm. as soon as you bring them into a position where you're asking them to work a little bit, they just, they cramp up. It doesn't mean they're weak. It just means they're not used to working in that position. Yeah. yeah. Did you feel abs and lats on there? Uh, not so much lats, but abs, yeah, definitely. I get the shakes. Perfect. Cool. Um, this is another one that we'll use sometimes um, where, if, and you don't have to use a ball. You can use like that ottoman you have row on, or you can use um, a chair or whatever. Um, but basically here, I'm getting these opposed. And that's not a rounded low back. That's a flat low back and a rounded T-spine, mm -hmm. right? So now I'm getting breath up here. My ribs are down. They're posed to my, um, my hips. And I'm providing pressure of elbows and knees coming toward each other. So I'm feeling my, rib, my abs get crushed right now. Are you pulling your elbows down and in? It almost looks like you're getting lat activation too. Um, or not really? I just have those like bat wing lats that always stick <laughs> out of my shirt. Um, yeah, I mean, there's probably some lats pulling me down back and in, but I'm feeling my, um, my abs hard there. But th these first two drills, guys, are, are drills that you might find that you don't have to now um, work all the hip mobility stuff or the hamstring stuff. Um, or the low back stretches before you work out. You might be able to hit these two drills a, a couple reps of each and you're done. I feel like for me, like the hamstring thing might be an issue because like a general like sit and reach or whatever, I'm great on. But I have the toughest time getting my hands under my shoulders when we do like, um, like a couch handstand push up. Mm -hmm. I just feel like I have nothing in my, so like, would these two be good for that? Yes. Yeah. You'll see as your ribs come down, you'll get better shoulder mobility as well. Okay. You should. And this is another one that's really hard. And, and Nick goes through progressions on this. Um, but if you guys are really trying to do a good reverse crunch, you're looking at your ribs are staying down the whole time. And you're controlling low back position. And you can change the intensity of it by straightening your knees. Um, and that ends up, if you're doing it right, to be a really hard exercise for people. And this, again, just to come back to the breathing thing for a minute, is one of the reasons why it's something I'm trying to be more active with how we're going to incorporate it in programming because if you just start, if you just literally lay on the floor and bring your, and you know, 
bring your, you know, um, bend your knees in that position. You are already, by the nature of how you are laying, you're in a neutral and supported position. And yep. so you can start to breathe by expanding basically through your, through your stomach before just filling up your diaphragm. So, so not just breathing, right? So stand up, not just breathing everything here, but rather getting this to fill, then this to fill, right? Mm -hmm. By the nature of doing that, you are creating pressure and you are priming your body to understand how it has to support itself. And yep. so, cause that's the, the, the issue where a lot of the stuff arises is that, you know, you, especially as you start moving quickly with weight, you then all of a sudden, you know, you, you go to do something heavy, you haven't braced because you're not ready. You haven't, you haven't primed that position to the point that, you know, John's making, which is totally, you know, of course he's spot on, but it's just such an easy way to prime an appropriate way to move without having to worry about all such stuff. Yep. Well, and Wiley, that's a perfect segue. Cause look at this exercise. If you turned your computer to the left, what position is Nick in? He's squatting. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. So now you start to build. He's stable. Ribs are down. Hips are under. And if you just turned him upside down, he's squatting. Right? So you're squatting. You're telling your nervous system, hey, this is a pattern that I can control. And now when you stand people upright, sometimes they lose it. But now he's just squeezing into it, crushing the foam roller and breathing through it without losing position. So he's building pressure in a squat pattern. So that, that's an exercise we'll use as a squat primer with some people. And then it's a known, um, it's a well-researched fact that isometric activities are also pain relieving. So someone that wants to squat with a little bit of low back soreness, you do this prior to the squat workout and it should help them find position, decrease their pain. And then you get them front squatting, zercher squatting, or a goblet squatting, and then you're helping someone train through low back pain. Isometric dead bug. And then you work into how hold progressions. So in this activity, um, Nick's using the band to engage his core before he starts to move into further progressions. So the goal here, ribs are down, hips are under, He's, again, keeping ribs down, back, and in, and optimal positions for pressure. Right. So um, now I'm going to go into, this is how we can kind of manage, we can kind of bias exercises. And I know um, if anybody has to leave, I know we're kind of going over, but that's fine. Um, squatting with low back pain. If you currently have pain or soreness or whatever, um, simple ways we can tweak an exercise to keep you in the, the workout of the day um, while continuing to make fitness gains. Um, elevate your heels. We're all very familiar with that. Um, one of my philosophical things right now with the back squats, um, at, in addition to not thinking general population necessarily has to back squat, is I think general population should all probably have their heels elevated too when we're starting to look at risk reward especially in a group class setting, you can still move a ton of load with your heels elevated. Um, but for the most part, instead of spending time on band ankle mobility stuff that you're going to hit every class because nobody seems to improve in it, just elevate their heels. Um, and you can get under moving load more quickly. Um, but you have Nick here again, heels elevated, a little bit of a reach. Knees are staying where they need to. And he's getting that juxtaposition of his hips underneath his ribs. And I have no problem loading someone with 200 pounds front squat in this position because they have a good position here to maintain pressure from the inside out. So one of the things that um, Nick was telling me that I'm kind of having trouble integrating into like real um, training is is like kind of what you just said right like like round like total rounding of like the lower back or not really the lower back but like the hip positioning mm -hmm. um because i really have like i have like an issue with my hips not as much my back but that's how he's been like working with it but then it's like 
you do um, like good mornings or or DLs, for example, and you know the cue is always flat back, flat back, flat back, and I'm like, but which one, <laughs> which mm -hmm. one do I do? Because like I understand why you wouldn't want to um, load with like shitty positioning, but then it's also like my hamstrings don't know how to work when my hips are in a better position. So which one should I be doing? Do you know yep. what I mean? Sorry, so that was a I, think, word. <laughs> I think you stay within the range of motion where your hips can control you and gradually as they gain control, you'll be able to improve, you'll lengthen that range of motion out. Mm -hmm. So that's where you start to fall into, all right, if you're doing an RDL or a good morning, build the floor up to you and pull it from blocks. Okay. Right. Mm -hmm. um, then you're starting to work and gain control in a range of motion. And as you gain control in that range of motion, gradually you take a block away because you're gaining more control and more range. Does that make sense? Yeah. But while maintaining like the rounded position more than the flat back, right? Is what you're saying. So I would argue, so Nick can get rounded here, but I think most people, it feels rounded, but their low back's not actually rounded because everybody lives in some level of extension and anterior pelvic tilt, mm -hmm. right? So when we all tuck under, it feels like we're rounded because we don't live there. Mm -hmm. But I don't think many people move through neutral into an actual low back rounding, okay. right? Um, so, you know, my cue a lot of, if that isn't tuck your hips under, it's, it's exhale through pursed lips and ribs down because ribs down will bring your hips underneath you. Yeah. So what right. do you, what are your opinions on like a butt wink with squatting? Cause I feel like that's kind of directly talking about this, right? Yeah. I, it's just a lack of, to me, it's a lack of control in that position right yeah. and it turns into a risk reward thing if you're if you're chasing load and you're okay with I, I, yeah I, and so i think it's just a lack of control in that position and so you drill positions where you have a lack of control but you wouldn't think that it's like a dangerous position to be in not necessarily because everybody's butt's going to wink if they go low enough right right there's also, there's always the line between you, like, this is one of the reasons why, like, um, strongman movements are, like, really useful for people because they're become, you, you have to, to the point that I, I think that John's making, correct me, I think I'm wrong, certainly, but, like, you have to be able to show control through positions. And so it's one thing if you can maintain a static position, but it's another thing if you can maintain, like, a few if you think of picking up a sandbag, you pick up some odd object from the floor, you have to have a degree of, of flexion through your back. And it's not necessarily, a, it's, it's, not a, it's not a bad thing. You need to have that. If the difference is being able to control it so that now you're not trying to compensate other ways. Because when you do that, you freak out under load. You try to do something different that your body's not used to. And then that's when things get pulled in directions that they're not used to doing. So it's good to move in different ways. And it's one of the reasons why, like, for instance, we, when we program, we don't always have you connected to bar, right? We want you to be doing stuff with dumbbells. We want you to do stuff with, you know, single arm, single leg, like bilateral, unilateral, like want to mix that up so that you could show that control through a greater range of motion. Um, so anyway, I mean, that's one I think it's one of the reasons why like Zurcher carries are really good, right? Like you, you shifted on the front of your body, you shifted from this, you know, front rack position up here, to now you've got to maintain this down here. So now you, you, you've changed how your back has to orient to the load, which is a really good thing. So anyway. Yeah, th that's exactly right. Like there's no bad movement, mm -hmm. right? We, the body should be resilient and it should be variable. The ability to have the ability to handle variable load. Mm -hmm. I think where a lot of people get into trouble is when they're always told knees shouldn't go in front of your toes during a squat. Don't pick up something with a, a rounded low back because what happens when you step off a curb or, you know, and you have to catch yourself and your knees come in front of your toes when you don't have control of that position is when you get hurt. Mm -hmm. Right. So I think um, everybody's been so ingrained to, and even like, I hate the cue now of butt back first in a back squat. 
because the first thing that does is arch your back. Yeah. So I'll cue knees forward first and, and that just gets hips underneath people and their knees don't go in front of their toes, but it keeps people more upright and they're not hips back first and crushing their low back. Mm -hmm. But I think we're so ingrained in knees don't go in front of toes or don't round your back. But in reality, we're just training the body to be resilient. So that's where some of those, um, those variable loads, like you were saying, Wiley, come into great, great, like they're great um, to throw into programming. They're fun sometimes, but then also um, they're training the body to be variable under different circumstances instead of training specific patterns, which life is never in a specific pattern. Right. Right. Um, yeah. So you'll very often, like what I'm taking you guys through today is very often the our program for a person in the clinic that's coming in with acute low back pain. Like a lot of times they're going through a couple of those lying, like that that bridge position, then they're going through the squat Nick did, and then they're moving up into something like this. And they're leaving happy, seeing ways that we can alter their program to continue them on their fitness path. And they're, they're feeling better because we've promoted the ability to maintain or um, hold load under position so if someone that's squat bias is having squat pain shorten their stance in the split squat put them in a zercher hold hips tucked under and this will crush them <laughs> so i'm maintaining ribs on top of hips i'm a flat low back zercher hold helps to um keep me upright and this front foot elevated biases me in a squat pattern Right. So if you have low back pain, that's a great alternative to getting under a bar. And you could load this sandbag up as much as you want, and I still wouldn't have back pain if you keep the positions. And then, of course, goblet squat, zercher squat, short hair back in the day. <laughs> Um, so deadlifting real quick. Um, this is how we bias people, um, into deadlift patterns. If they have, um, pain with the deadlift, right. We can go like a rear foot elevated split squat with, a, a, um, goblet, zercher, however hold like anterior load you want, whatever anterior load with a short. You're not bringing this foot out wider because as soon as you start to reach that leg back, you're going to start to arch your back. So again, the goal is finding the position where you're stacked, ribs down. So before you start the first rep, you're exhaling. So ribs come down, hips come underneath, keeping a little shorter stance and you're not stressing your low back. And then of course the trap bar, right? So trap bar is a great way. Um, elevated trap bar, trap bar from the floor. Another great way to kind of bias a lift if you're having trouble with a straight bar deadlift. Ribs down, hips under. That's a better neck position on that one. Um, so basically, um, injury prevention is lifelong, but how can we bias exercises to fit positions that specific in individuals are in? So hopefully you guys saw, like when we went through our progressions, especially the squat progression, if it's a squat day or a deadlift day, some of these preparing position exercises help prep rib cage, hips tucked under to create good pressure then you start to bias the exercises um, where maybe one person is appropriate to do a back squat but another person has to be doing this type of squat while another person is doing a front foot elevated zercher squat so everybody's doing the same workout but their exercises are biased to what they are dealing with at the time right to set everybody up for success. Um, then um, most injuries, and Wiley, maybe you can speak to this, but 
most injuries in your setting are probably more of like the overuse volume based strains not a ton of people blowing out backs with like significant disc herniations or any of that am i correct a lot of it's just like strains totally the the one the the guy who i referenced earlier who i i had hoped he was gonna log in for tonight so he's been a been an athlete with us for three at least three years um and he uh slipped a disc in his back pushing his kid's bed uh trying to push it from one side of the room to the other at home trying to uh like reorganize their house um so yeah it's either injuries either happen when we forget when we don't treat all movement the same way like i i vividly remember i first started like doing crossfit just you know when i joined gym I vividly remember the first time that I was at my work at the time and I bent over to pick up a box and I thought to brace my core first. <laughs> I, I vividly remember it because I was like, oh shit, this is like real life. <laughs> this works. Um, so yeah, it's usually over you stuff. I mean, freak things happen. But yeah, generally speaking, that's it's why, for instance, one of the reasons I wrote a big blog about this on our site today, not to plug that, but like, why we're prioritizing the programming for you all that we are when you come back into the gym that you've been doing a lot of high repetition kind of mid energy system work at home you've been doing a lot of these high repetition 15 ish minute workouts these kinds of things when you come back into the gym we'll have those two classes the workout of the day that's really structured towards rebuilding strength and looking at how you all are moving pattern wise building building you back up but then also we'll incorporate lower intensity endurance training so that you can get the other side of the equation and balance out that more higher end work that you're doing. Um, so it, it relates back to just volume and progression as we start to reintroduce you all to, you know, weight training. Yeah. Yeah. And I think like what you said, Wiley, I don't, uh, we don't, most of our injuries aren't happening at high load. Most of our injuries are happening at warm up sets where a guy's squatting 135 and he's working up to a 450. Mm -hmm. Or the guy that's moving his furniture, the guy that's pretty strong, but he's moving his furniture at home and he tweaks something. We're not seeing a lot of injuries happening under high load. Mm -hmm. So, um, it, you know, it just goes to show like, you know, injury prevention is lifelong. Most injuries are chronic and overuse type injuries. Um, you know, so some of these things that we went over today, hopefully if, if you're able to incorporate them, they just help to bulletproof you and make you more resilient and change the the thought process of, okay, maybe it's not always a foam roll and a band mobilization, but if I can promote a better position of some of the more proximal structures, muscles will be in a better position to control what I need them to. And that inherently improves my mobility, improves my stability, and we can move into the workout from there. So if you guys have any questions, I know it was a lot. Um, this is my contact information. Um, we are down in Garnet Valley. Um, we have, we are also treating Nick's in um, requisite fitness, but this is how you can contact me, the company on Instagram, um, or email, shoot me an email, shoot me a phone call. We'll take care of everyone. Um, and I, I appreciate you, Wiley, for bringing me on. I really do. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I hope this was, this was helpful. I mean, this is, this is great. Um, thank you. I'm stoked yeah. Thank you. you so much for coming on. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah. Thank so, you. Any uh, questions in closing? No. You pretty, you made it pretty, pretty easy to understand. Awesome. Thank you guys so much. I appreciate you. All right. Yeah. Thank thank you so much. Much. yeah. And I'll send you, um, I'll send you the link for this. Um, so okay. that you can, you can put it out there on your uh, your channels as well. So cool. Thank you, Wiley. I appreciate it. All right. Thanks, everybody. Enjoy your evening. Right. Thank you. Thank you guys. Thank yeah. you. Yep.